So uh, let's just start with, um, you know, where, where had this been an idea that was uh, percolating for a while with you? Where did this start? I have wanted to do a Peter Pan origin story for about 20 years. When I was, I guess, nine years old, I got stuck on a Peter Pan amusement park ride with my dad. And we were on that part of the ride where you're in a pirate ship and you're flying over miniature London. And we got stuck up there for about 20 minutes. And I remember just peppering my dad with all kinds of questions about why. Why is Peter Pan Peter Pan? How did he get to Neverland? Why did he and Hook hate each other so much? And he sort of played along and gave me some answers. But I was kind of just mystified by all these things and thought about it for the next two decades and ultimately led me to writing this movie. Yeah, it's interesting because uh We've kind of just uh, taken it as a given that he can fly, but we don't really know a lot of how that came to be. It was great to see this. I just, I just felt like the original Barry book, which I fell in love with at a pretty young age, left so many unanswered questions, and I'd never had a sort of satisfactory answer to them. And I wanted to know what made the characters that so many people know and love the way they were when we first meet them. You know, especially the Hook Peter dynamic. I was just sort of, I was curious why these two characters hated each other so much, and I thought, well, for two people to hate each other that much, they must have really cared about each other at one point. They must have really loved each other. And so that was the genesis of building that relationship and everything kind of extended out from there. But it was, it was really, really important for me in writing the script to make sure that it felt like an organic extension of the Barry book. Everything we did, we did with an eye towards making it feel like a part of that original mythology and a part of that original world. So even a character like Blackbeard, who a lot of people are not going to be familiar with as a character in the Barry world, is actually referenced on one page of the book, page 53. It says, Hook trained as a bosun under Blackbeard. And so from that I thought, oh, well maybe that's our bad guy. And maybe when he arrives in Neverland, he's become this sort of tyrannical ruler who's throwing these kids in the dust mines to work night and day, toiling, digging for pixie dust. Uh, and so it was this kind of effort to make this large, extraordinary world with a very sort of focused, heartfelt journey at the core of it where young Peter is just trying to find his mom. You know, I don't know how it works for your process, but um, are you seeing the, the images of what this should look like in your head? And, and now that you've seen it on screen, did it exceed what you could have imagined? Because it is so fantastical. Well, you've seen so many versions of Neverland. If you've read the book, you have one image in your head. If you've seen all the different sort of film iterations, you've seen many different looks at what this place could look like. But I have never seen anything like what Joe Wright and the team on this movie constructed. They built a Neverland that was both truer, I think, to the original spirit of Barry's book, and also bigger and more lavish and more real than anything I'd ever seen. And that was a big part of Joe's mission. Joe and our production designer, Lean Veneto, really approached Neverland as a real place. They wanted to find a way to practically build these sets so it felt like a tactile environment. So many of these sort of big fairy tale revisionist movies with so much CGI tend to feel like their worlds are a little bit at arm's reach. You can't reach out and touch them. You almost feel like you're a little distant. And so Joe and Aline set out to figure out a way to build this place. And that included building the Neverwood. We had a four block stretch of this place that they built in these massive air hangars about an hour north of London. I had never seen anything like, you would get lost in those sets. We lost Hugh Jackman for about 30 minutes in one of those, which is not good when you lose your movie star deep, deep within the Neverwood. We recovered him, thankfully, and he was able to complete shooting on the film. And most importantly, I mean, it can all, anything could happen when the, with the casting. So when, uh, were you privy to any of that casting, or how did that go? They kept me very far. No, they, I was, when you write a script, you sort of, you have your dream cast in mind, and it doesn't, at least to me, occur to you that any of these people might really be possible. So when I wrote Blackbeard, I thought, oh man, Hugh Jackman would be amazing for this role. I don't know that we could ever get an actor like him, but that would be incredible. And suddenly you find out Hugh's signing on to do it, and you sort of pinch yourself. And the same was true of Garrett. Garrett was another actor who I really, when I, conceived of what our version of Captain Hook would look like, I sort of saw him as this character straight out of Treasure of the Sierra Madre with a little bit of an Indiana Jonesy feel, and Garrett to me personifies all those things. He is this very sort of traditional, heroic leading man. But again, it didn't occur to me in a million years that Garrett Hedlund would actually be walking onto that set, donning the fedora and playing Hook before the Hook. Um, and when it came to Levi, it, casting Peter Pan is really challenging because we're asking a young, then 11-year-old actor to carry a two-hour movie. 
and we just didn't know if we would find a kid who could handle that. And we looked at, I can't remember how many tapes, I think over two or 3,000, we did a worldwide casting search in every English-speaking country across the globe trying to find our kid. And at a certain point in that process, you're kind of pulling your hair out hopeless and going, I don't know if we're gonna find our Peter. And then suddenly you watch Levi's tape and go, oh, there's, there's Peter Pan, we're making a movie. And it was, it was just that simple. Levi is a really special actor. Uh, what, what do you think is important about the, the Peter Pan story uh, if, to, for today's kids? Peter Pan is one of these stories that just resonates with kids for all time. I think that it's a story that means a very different thing depending what age you're at. I think as a kid, it really is a story about wish fulfillment and the belief that anything is possible. You know, there's a land called Neverland that feels straight out of your imagination where you could be anything you want to be, where there are no rules, where pirates can chase natives and never cross, can sort of leap into the air and never birds soar. Uh, and so I think it is that belief in the impossible being possible. And for a, a young kid like Peter, who at the outset of the movie is an orphan, who feels his mom has abandoned him, who doesn't know where he fits into the world, who suddenly realizes maybe there is a reason for everything. Maybe he is not a child who's been discarded, but is in fact special. I think that's a really powerful message for kids who maybe are lost and don't know exactly what their way is going to be to know that sometimes when things are at their hardest is just when they're about to get to their best. Um, and I think that for, for grown-ups the Peter Pan mythology has been something that's meant so much because I think it's a reminder to never lose the kid inside yourself. I think it's very easy to sort of lose that sense of childlike wonder and awe and the belief in the impossible and the sort of tumult of everyday grown-up life. And Barry's book I think still resonates for grown-ups as a clarion call not to forget that.